Good morning. Uh, it's, I'm glad that you're taking a moment to uh, watch this. And uh, I don't really have any announcements. Well, I do have one announcement. Uh, the Honeywell Church continues to worship at 8 a.m. in the morning uh, outside uh, in its front lawn. And uh, the Shabina Methodist Church is now worshiping in its uh, parking lot outside. And it has moved to 9.30 a.m., which we think will help keep us a little bit cooler. So uh, with that, the reading this day comes from this moment when the disciples have asked Jesus to teach, teach them how to pray. And in Mark 6, we read, Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also for forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. On a Sunday night, a few years ago when I was living in Milan, I was suddenly in for the night when my cell phone rang. And it was the local the sheriff, Roger Smiley, was calling me. And he asked if I could come down to dispatch to 911 uh, so that I, he needed a hand. So I figured I was about to walk into a bit of a mess. I was right. And I walked in and um, drove up, walked in. And after greeting everyone, I asked what was going on. A city police officer had picked up a young woman who was on the street who had an infant with her, a few month old young boy. And they had, uh, or she had, hacked off the motel owner in Milan. And like, that's it, that's the motel. If you've hacked off the motel owner, and the, they were very patient people, then um, you had nowhere to go especially if you had no money. And this lady, she uh, told us that she had come to Milan to work at the plant. And, and I could never get clear whether the pork plant, whether she didn't have a job because she couldn't get on or she'd had a job and gotten let go. I, I don't know what happened. But the long and short of it was she had no money. She had no place to stay. And because she had a young infant, uh, the, it complicated the situation because if it had been just her, I mean, we could have given her some food and she wanted us to let her go so she could just walk to the next town and, and I would have filled up a backpack with anything she wanted from the grocery store and said, okay, if that's what you want, here's your food and, and, and that would have been fine. But she had that infant, that boy. And, um, and so as soon as we released them, uh, then it was, it was in the evening, and then we were all going to have to call the children's division because now we knew of an infant who didn't have shelter. And so now we had, because so a child was being endangered. And so we, we had to find a place for this lady to stay. And so uh, the lady, had, as I said, had gotten sideways with them. Um, the owners of the motel, and so we had nowhere to go. And so I got the call from Roger, the sheriff, because he, he was, he needed some help. And Andy, do you know anyone in surrounding counties? And okay, yeah, I do. So I started making some phone calls and um, it's figuring out where she could go. And that's where um, things started to get kind of weird working with her because she was working at the plant and the plant had stopped seeking to recruit people from Central and South America. The pork plant had moved to recruiting people from overseas from Africa. To get to America from Africa, you have to have your paperwork in order. And she had her paperwork in order. She had a green card, she had her work permit, she had everything she needed to be there legally. And she also had her own background of being raised in Africa as a young woman. And in Africa, where she was raised as a young woman, if an authority figure came to your village dressed in a uniform, that wasn't necessarily a good thing. She had been raised to be afraid of people who showed up in uniforms because they could be there to help, but it was just as likely that they were there to take something. 
cattle or burn something or, or cause a problem, right? She had seen authority figures abuse their authority. And so there I was, like an authority figure, which was kind of weird to see myself as an authority figure, but that's what, that was the situation, right? I'm, I'm standing there with uh, Roger, the sheriff, authority figure, uniform, and, and the local uh, cop and the uh, local police officer and the people working 911, and there I was, and we were like the, the symbols of authority for her. And, and so it was very tense to work out with her what was gonna happen. Because I knew what I could do. There was an amazing pastor over in Kirksville who agreed to take her in and, and get that worked out, and that's what happened. But to convince her that this was a good thing, um, the distrust was palpable. It was just really obvious there. And I pondered afterwards, like we, we moved the moved the lady to the edge of the county, the sheriff took her to the edge of the county, the next county over there, sheriff's office came and got her and transported her to the church she needed to be at, and, and it got worked out. But it was afterwards that I started pondering, what would she teach her, her child as that child grew up? How would she teach him to react to authority figures, specifically to police officers? After her own experience of growing up, in Africa, when authority figures were to be doubted and to be fled from, how would her experience in America change her mind? I don't know the answer to that, and I never will. But that came to mind today as I was contemplating the same question for a different family. You see, George Floyd, the person who died this week, black man in Minneapolis, who died after a police officer knelt on his neck, putting his knee into George Floyd's neck for eight minutes, such that George Floyd died uh, suffocated. Right? George Floyd has a daughter. George Floyd has a daughter. And this daughter, it turns out, is old enough to watch TV, but young enough to be confused as to why her, daughter, why her daddy's name is being said again and again. And so she asked her mom, why do they keep on talking about my dad? And, and this is what the mom was sharing in an interview. And the mom said, I didn't know what to tell her. And, and I, I was thinking about th this question, like what should the Floyd family tell George Floyd's daughter. What should they teach her about how to interact with police officers? I was watching the video of the Floyd family making a statement, and there's a cousin, and it's a brother, and I'm not quite sure. There are multiple family members, the adult family members talking. And in the back of the frame, I could see uh, two younger, probably teenage boys. I'm not sure on their ages. I don't know if they're cousins or nep nephews. I don't know what they are. But they're, they're family, right? They're part of the Floyd family making this, this statement. And I, again, that horrible question. What should the Floyd family teach to those boys, those teens, about how to interact with police officers? I don't know, right? I don't know the answer to that. I know how I interact with police officers. But let me tell you about a moment that I had an interaction with a police officer. I was driving out of Milan. This has about, been about four or five years ago now. I was driving out of Milan. I was heading northwest. I almost always headed south or east, going northwest out of Milan. Uh, it wasn't something I did often. I was, I was out to visit someone new. And um, as I was going down the, the two-lane, flat, wide country road, um, I was getting up to speed. I was well out of town. And uh, lights came on behind me. And so I pulled over. And the highway patrolman showed up, or, uh, rolled down my window. Can I see your... A license and insurance. So, okay, here it is. And he asked if I knew what the speed limit was. And I said, well, I'm, I'm out of town at 65. And he said, no, sir, it's, it's not 65 till over there. And, and you were going 73 in a, in a 55. And I looked at him and I said, officer, I mean, I was speeding. I was not aware it was 55. You're right, it was 65. But I was going 66. And if you want to give me a ticket for going 66 in a 55 zone, I will pay that ticket. But I was not going 73. 
And the guy was silent for a second, and he said, you're right. And he said, carry along and, and, and slow down and, and have a nice day, and he, and he left. And it was this moment for me, like I was just flabbergasted. The highway patrolman lied to me. He said I was going 73, and I wasn't. Like, <laughs> this is my response. I've been pulled over before, and if I get pulled over, as soon as I see the lights, I look down at my speedometer so I know exactly what I was doing, because if you catch me speeding, you got me, right? I will pay a ticket if I, if I, if I am inadvertently speeding, but I wasn't. I, well, I wasn't, I was speeding, I was going 66 and a 55. I, I thought it was six, I, I didn't know where the speed limit was, that's on me, right? I, I should have gotten a ticket for that. But I was told I was going 73 and he lied to me and I called him on it and he backed down. And then he drove away, and, and then I got on the phone because I know a highway patrolman. And I called that highway patrolman and I said, there's a problem. And I explained the situation, and this highway patrolman said he would take care of it. Right? And I, it is striking to me in retrospect that first, I disagreed with a highway patrolman, and then I knew who to call about it. And I immediately did. And he listened, the other, and the highway patrolman that I know listened to me. And I think this gets at one of the most profound differences between growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, which I, I grew up uh, just west of Joliet in the suburbs of Chicago, and, what, and, and living in rural Missouri. Like one of the most profound differences between living in the suburbs of a city or in the city and living in rural America is that you know the police in rural America, right? I knew that it was a new highway patrolman because I had been told there was a new highway patrolman in town by Roger Smiley, the sheriff, when I'd had coffee with him earlier that week, right? Roger Smiley, the sheriff, was a member of the church I served, and I knew him and I knew his wife, and his wife had the most amazing uh, Christmas decorations every year. It was just amazing, amazing landscaping, right? I know that family, and then I, I know, uh, and I knew the chief of police, Morris May. Like, he and I had helped build the community corner where the uh, the farmers market is now held every every year, and his wife uh, Pam May was my chair of the board, and she worked for the the local lawyer, and so I knew the lawyer who, and I know both I knew both of the lawyers in town, and I knew the county commissioners, and one of the county, the presiding county commissioner was a member of my church, and I knew the judge, and so if there had been a real problem. If that highway patrolman had said, no, sir, you really were going 73, and I had to deal with that, like if I had a legitimate problem with this highway patrolman, there was no question in my mind that I would be able to go back to town, and it was not a matter of could I call someone, it was who to call first. And then from there, it would have been solved. Like, it would just have been solved because I, I, that was Milan, and I knew all the people involved. And if I said that I was going this speed, like, that is my word, and my word is my bond, and that would have been taken care of. And I'm confident that that's the case here as well. Like, here in Shelby County, if there is a problem, I can call Jerry Fenton. And I know Jerry. We've done some, we've worked together. He's been at the round table. I want to invite him to speak at the next one. I've been at city council meetings with him, right? If Jerry Fenton needs help, I will help him. And if I can, and if I need help, I will call him. And, and like, the, I know the, the sheriff. I, I know the, the, the local judge. I know the, the local mayor. Like, I know the people. If there is a problem in a rural community, I know what to do about it. And I'm sure you do too, if you live in a rural community. Like if we had a problem right here at the Shelbina United Methodist Church, we had a problem with a police officer. Like if, if I got the board together and said, what do we need to do? I am absolutely certain that we could have any problem resolved and taken care of in a way that would be reasonable and respectful and that would, that would work out. That is what relation, uh, having relationships with the police officers is like in rural Missouri. And growing up in the suburbs, that is not the situation. 
It just wasn't. Growing up in, in, in just west of Joliet, I didn't know the police at all. I didn't know a single police officer. The police were a force. Of, uh, they were like a force of nature. They were the, these people who walked around in uniforms and you don't talk to them. Like that was my distinct sense growing up. I will never talk to a police officer because nothing good will ever come of talking to a police officer. And if, if there was ever a problem, I don't have a clue who I would have talked to. I don't have a clue what I would have done. There was no sense of, of connection, right? There was no sense of being able to figure out who to talk to to resolve conflicts or misunderstandings. I was listening to an interview with the mayor of the city of Minneapolis, like the dude who has been elected to be in charge of the city. And what he says of his police force is that if he and the chief of police think that someone should be fired, they can't make that happen. Right? They can't make that happen. That is the situation when it comes to city uh, police uh, uh, the city police forces, right? There is not only a sense of the, the police are them, you don't interact with them because to involve them is going to cause a problem. There is a further sense that even if you do speak up, even if you are heard, nothing can be done about it because it is almost impossible to fire a police officer. It is almost impossible, right? It is a deep-seated problem in America, the inability to reform police departments of the cities. Now, I do need to say that there are amazing police officers, right? And to be a police officer today is a remarkably challenging task because we have made our police officers into our social workers, into our mental health care workers, and we have pushed way too much onto police officers, and that is an entire topic onto itself. But in the city, where there is no sort of feedback loop, there's no ability to get your voice heard, and you can't fire a cop who doesn't use force correctly and safely, how many times, how many people does it take for the entire police force to be viewed as a threat? How many times does someone have to die at the hands of a police officer for, police officer for the entire force to be viewed as a threat? And so I, I want to be clear that what we are used to in rural America, a way of life where we pay our taxes, send our kids to a good school, we count on the police to take care of us and the city will make sure our utilities stay on, right? that's what we're used to. And we are amazingly privileged to have that. Because in parts of the city that are predominantly black, that is not the case. People who live in predominantly black communities in the city, they pay their taxes, but their schools are not up to snuff, and they cannot count on the police to protect them. I was talking to a group of other pastors about this this week uh, on Zoom, because you can't go anywhere right now, really. But I was talking about this online, and one pastor jumped in and said, you know, he, uh, there's a black man who works for his church. And this guy, uh, he has a son in high school. And this son in high school has a 3.9 GPA, honor student, great kid, right? Headed towards a good future, right? And what this father has had to do for his son is tell him that there are certain rules that we have to live by. For example, you can never have a black cell phone because to reach into your pocket and pull out something that is black if a police officer sees that, you have to be certain that they don't think it's a gun. Because that has happened. That has happened, right? And so, uh, and he has told his son, like, we have to look at what type of car you can drive so you don't get pulled over for driving too nice of a car. And as, as uh, one, one of my friends was telling me about this, another friend um, was talking about how he had gone to help a, a historically black Methodist church and how he was in a Sunday school room and how in this Sunday school room where young Methodist children are taught how to love Jesus, there was also a list of rules on the wall about how to interact with police officers. Never argue. Always keep your hands in sight. Never raise your voice. Never resist. Because if you don't, you, you will be in danger. Now, this is amazing and surprising and depressing and horrifying. And, and is it new? 
Like all these things that we are seeing over the last couple of years, is this a new thing? I don't think it is. I think what's happening is that we have smartphones on us and they can all take videos. And so we are starting to see things that have been happening all along, but because now we have videos, we cannot ignore them. And the videos are shocking. Just in the last few weeks, we have seen this video of Ahmad Aubrey, who was out jogging, and uh, a black man jogging evidently scared a father and son who were white, and uh, Ahmed Aubrey was shot to death. And, and, uh, we, and we have this video of George Floyd, of uh, three officers standing by while a fourth one held his knee to the back of George Floyd's neck and, uh, and for over eight minutes until George died. And we have that video. And in a, a horrible twist, there's also, this has also been the last week or so that the story of Breonna Taylor has come out, who was an EMT and um, her boyfriend was a, a suspect by the police. He matched the description and uh, this happened in Kentucky. And so three officers broke into her house with a no-knock warrant in the middle of the night. And, uh, and even though the, the person they were looking for had actually been found a few hours earlier, th this still happened. And so, um, and so there was no reason to do this because the, the actual suspect had been found. But they broke in, three officers broke into her house with a no-knock warrant. And uh, what the boyfriend did is what we believe everyone has the right to do. Second Amendment, right? The guy, the boyfriend reached for his gun, which he had for self-defense, and shot at three men who had broken into his house in the middle of the night uh, and were shooting at him. And so the bo uh, Brianna, the, the girlfriend, is dead. And the three officers say that... Uh, they, they announced that they were police, and the boyfriend says that they really did not announce that they were police, and in the odd twist, the three officers, none of them had their body cameras on. Um, so this, it's a horrible story because there wasn't video, right? But it's still this horrible story, and that's just the three things that have come out in the last two weeks. This is becoming a recurring theme of, as of the last couple years, and I have to confess that there have been so many of these in the last couple years that the names start to blend together, and I start to lose track of who died, why, and under what circumstances. And so, you, I mean, I, the names, these are the names of Trayvon Martin and Eric Gardner, who was also suffocated uh, by a police officer, of Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old who was playing with a BB gun, and when police officers drove up on this situation, they, they, they shot him. Of Alton Sterling, of Philando Castile, who uh, told the police officer uh, he was pulled over, and um, he told the police officer that he he had a, a concealed carry license, and he was going to go reach down and pull his gun out and, and put it in plain sight so everyone knew what was happening, and the police officer shot him, and there's a video of him dying in front of his girlfriend. And, and so these names start to blend together for me, and I am ashamed to admit that, but that just tells me that uh, this is not something that I can ignore. Now, I have to confess that I had a plan for today. I had a plan for today, and this wasn't it. My plan for today was that I was going to be in Springfield, and I was going to be preaching for a friend of mine who lives in Springfield and uh, preaching for him so that he could have the Sunday off. He usually doesn't get a Sunday off for annual conference. I was going to be preaching for him and then going out to have lunch and then spending the afternoon attempting to stay awake in the very cold conference center uh, during meetings that may not be the most exciting thing I've ever been to. But then COVID-19 hit, and so here I am, and so I, I am not in Springfield. And I just figured that I would move up the next set of sermons one Sunday, and we would start looking at the Lord's Prayer. It's time to look at that. I think we need to, right? Lord's Prayer. How do we pray? How, do, how, does, how does Jesus answer the disciples when the disciples ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray? And so I started looking at that this week in the midst of these videos, in the midst of this news, and I kept on looking at the first start, the first, uh, what starts the, the, the Lord's Prayer, the first two words, Our Father. 
And it kept on coming back to me how many other people were praying those two words this morning. Our Father. By my count, there are 28 Methodist churches in Minneapolis. And so this weekend, on Sunday morning, they will be pre praying with us, our Father. And if they're saying our Father at the same time we're saying our Father, that makes us brothers and sisters. And so we have 28 Methodist churches among countless other types of churches up in Minneapolis who are praying to our Father in the middle of the city where George Floyd's family is trying to explain to his daughter what happened. Trying to raise children who have to be told that you can't own a black cell phone because if you pull that out in front of a police officer and he thinks it's a gun, your life could be at risk. I had a plan and it did not involve talking about this. I am rather nervous about it. It is making me rather uncomfortable. I do not want to deal with any potential anger that talking about this topic might stir up. But I cannot shake it that there are people who are praying our Father right now. Followers of Jesus Christ in Minneapolis are praying our Father right now. People whose lives have been turned upside down by days of protest over the way that police officers treat people of color. And this is what Jesus taught us to pray. Right? The disciples asked for this and we can't get away from it. Like, if we're going to pray at all today, we are going to pray what Jesus taught us to pray. And we have to pray our Father. And to pray our Father is to name that we are part of a family. And that means this is a family affair. And that our brothers and sisters are suffering. And that means we are suffering too. We are all connected. We all are, have the same Father. We are all children of God. Right? Any of us who are fathers, the fact that we are a father, whether we are a good father or not, is due to how much we reflect the nature of who God our Heavenly Father is. Right? That's the call upon every father, to love like our Heavenly Father's love. And it is amazing to me to think about what it would be like to be a father of children who are fighting. Like my, my children, they, they fight on occasion, but within five minutes they get over it and they're playing again. I'm, I'm talking about, like, what would it be like to have your children really fighting? Like, I, I think about Minneapolis, and I think about, yes, how many people of color are praying to our Father right now, but also how many police officers are in churches right now as well, praying to our Father for thy will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? The, to have brothers fight is a common refrain in Scripture. It is something that God has endured often, having his children fight. And the horrible thing about a family fight is how often, it, how much it just pulls everyone else in. I, I hope you don't have the experience of this, but I, I'm afraid many of us have, where there has been a fight in the family and everyone kind of gets pulled into it. Everyone gets impacted. It, it, everyone gets involved in it because these two people are having a fight and it just causes the tension in the whole family to go up. I think that's where we're at. Our family's having a fight. Our father. We are children. Yeah. And so I turn to Scripture for guidance on how to act in this moment. And I read in James, the book of James, James 1. The advice that is given is to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Slow to speak, quick to listen. Quick to try and understand. Quick to seek out people who can tell us what we don't already know. There is much that we do not understand yet. I know that I have been spending my time this week learning trying to learn from my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who live in different places and contexts than I do. And what I, have been what I have been learning is that these situations are always messy. Always messy. In the middle of a protest, at some point in the length of the protest, whether it's during the day or at night, there's always going to be someone who causes violence. There's always going to be someone who picks up a brick. There's always going to be someone who acts in a self-centered way, right? It's always messy. 
It's always messy because there are always exceptions. In the middle of describing how, the, I'm talking about how the police force, from, the point of, from my point of view, uh, raised in the suburbs, the police force was just like the, that thing over there, there the force, and describing, uh, engage, trying to understand what that is like in the cities today. Like, there are always going to be police officers who are amazing and humble and servants of the community, and there are always going to be stories of that, those police officers stepping forth to serve, and I cherish those stories. Like, that's amazing, and that's wonderful. There are always, these situations are always messy. There are always exceptions. There's always going to be a counter story. All right. As we, as we talk about this, uh, growing up near Chicago, the, the counter story I was oft, I often heard whenever racism came up, it was someone usually, almost inevitably, came back with, "But Michael Jordan seems to be doing fine." Y you're right, Michael Jordan is doing fine, right? And, and so, in the modern version of that, it seems to be the Barack Obama response. Right? Talking about racism today, and but Barack Obama was president. Yes, yes, Barack Obama was president. That, that is one person in one situation. That doesn't change that this is an entire context with an entire history and, and that in the middle of all of this mess, we can always find an exception and that the story here is most clearly discerned not in any one moment, but in the statistics. And isn't that depressing and boring to say? But it is in the statistics that it becomes very clear what is happening here. It is when we look at wealth distribution and housing values, incarceration rates, health access, unemployment, education. It's when we look at these factors and how they divide out by race in America that we start to see these trends that are really horrifying and challenging to see. And each one of those is worth taking the time to look at. I'll look at just education briefly. Because to me, it is another example of how this is complex. When it comes to education, it is true that our Father calls us to make wise decisions. We are morally accountable for the decisions that we make. That's part of being made in the image of God. And we can always find examples of young black men making wise decisions and poor decisions. And we can agree that the wise decision for a young man is to get a job and to serve his community. And we can also start looking at the trends, the statistics. The dropout rate by race in America nationwide is that 14% of white students drop out of high school before getting a high school degree. 14%. 31% of black students drop out before getting a high school degree. This is according to 2012 uh, data nationwide. And so the dropout rate is twice in a black community what it is in a white community. Without a, without a high school diploma, it is easy, I mean, to tell young black men you need to get a job. Getting a job without, without a high school diploma is really hard, if not impossible. So why is there a high school, why is there a high dropout rate, or why is there a higher dropout rate? Well, it might be connected to the difference in funding if you look at funding by race. In a predominantly white school, when a child walks in the door, again, nationwide data collected in February 2019, when a white child walks into a predominantly white school, that child, on average, brings $13,908 in tax funding with him or her. So about 14 grand. On average, when a black child walks into a predominantly black school, he or she brings $11,682. That's about $2,500 difference. You think it's a challenge to run a school? a school of excellence, a school that can pay teachers well, a school that has good lab equipment and gym equipment that is well maintained and repaired with two and a half thousand dollars less per year per child, right? And then what, what determines that? What drives school funding? What drives school funding is local property taxes. 
So you start to see how this connects together, right? We expect people to make wise decisions. And if we want children, both black and white, to be able to grow up and make wise decisions and seek employment and serve their communities, then they need to be able to both get high school degrees. And if I want young black men and young black women to be able to have uh, the ability to get high school degrees, giving them a good school to work in sure would help. And so if I want them to have a good school to, to learn in, it might be that we need to change the funding approach to how schools are funding, funded. Maybe having a statewide property tax and say that every child will be equally funded for every child is equally a child of God. Now, maybe this is a good idea, maybe it isn't. But what I hope it does show is the way that personal responsibility and systems work together and that there is no such thing as a simple answer here. Right, maybe this is a bad idea, and if, I'm, if, I, if it turns out I'm wrong about this, please tell me, and I'll, I'll tell you I'm wrong next Sunday. Right? I, I join in the confession with everyone else, and if, I, if I'm wrong, that isn't a surprise. But what I do know is that we need to continue to learn, because there is much that we do not know, and there's much that we need to listen to from the other members of our family. Our Bishop Bob Farr is leading us in doing this. This fall, across the conference, every Methodist pastor is reading a book called White Fragility that names and explores why it is so deeply uncomfortable for us to talk about this. And if this has been an uncomfortable thing to listen to, I'm sorry. It's not been any more comfortable to say it myself, or not just speaking for myself. And then another book that we'll be looking at across the conference is a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. How not just to be not racist, but how to work against racism. I do not yet know how the churches I serve will engage these books. We haven't figured it out yet. I still don't have copies of both of them. I mean, we will figure it out. My friends, I may have to recant of some of what I said today if I am wrong. And if I am wrong, please tell me. Please swing by. Let's drink some coffee on my front porch and let me know where you're at and what you're thinking. What I can tell you with confidence, though, is that Jesus taught us to pray, and the words he taught us to use first is our Father. And I am confident that there are a lot of children of God out there right now who are praying to our Father, who are praying that this scourge of racism in America might pass, that we might grapple with it in a way that matters, that we might grapple with it in a way that changes things, that we might grapple with it such that we become a little bit more like Jesus, so that indeed Christ's kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you have given us your prayer so that we might learn to pray as your people, knowing that we would need help learning to pray. You gave us the first words, our Father, to remind us that we never pray alone. And we always pray as children of our Father. Help us to see this clearly today, that we are indeed connected to each other as a family. And as members of this family, as brothers and sisters are suffering, we pray for them, that they might have hope. We pray for those who are set aside to serve our communities, including our police officers. May they be true to their calling and to their oaths. We give you thanks for all of them that are. We ask for your patience and wisdom as we learn, for this situation is hard and it is tempting to jump to easy black and white answers. We pray for patience to be slow to speak and quick to listen. We pray for the continuing challenge of this virus that makes everything so much harder right now. We pray for those who grapple to treat it, to come up with a vaccine, for those who are uh, trying to not get it. We, we pray for all the people who are impacted by this. We pray for our leaders that they might continue to make wise choices on our behalf. We pray for all these things as we pray the prayer that you did taught, teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. I hope that uh, you continue to be safe, and I hope that uh, in this time where a lot is up in the air, you have a few moments of, of peace to uh, simply relax, um, because it's challenging days. Uh, my prayers are with you.